Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And before we start the great show, I just want to invite you this coming September 15th through 17th, 2017, I'll be a, speaking live at a beautiful afterlife symposium where you can meet the cutting edge people on uh, after death communications, uh, evidence of life after death, and so much more. So if you're interested, I invite you to go to afterlifestudies.org, even if you can't make it, to find out who these amazing people are and what's going on. So that's Scottsdale, Arizona. I'm not sure if I mentioned that. September 15th through 17th, 2017, afterlifestudies.org. So today on the show, I'm pleased to introduce you to my new friend, Carl Jackson Barnes. Now here's a little bit about Carl. He has studied mediumship in the UK for 30 years, both as a researcher and a practitioner. He is the editor and publisher for Psychic Book Club Publishing, which, among others, produces vintage and new books on spirit communication. Carl also manages the new Leslie Flint Trust website, which is full of vintage recordings of genuine spirit communications through the unique voice mediumship of UK medium Leslie Flint. Now, you can visit Carl's websites, psychicbookclub.com. You can go to facebook.com slash psychicbookclub or to find out more about the incredible Leslie Flint, visit leslieflint.com. So warm welcome, Carl Jackson Barnes. Welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Hi, Sandra. It's great to be with you. Yeah, great to be here and great to be new friends with you on Facebook. I love that not everybody likes Facebook, but I tell you, it's a great place for me to meet new friends, especially passionate it's, about this topic. Facebook's a wonderful tool, and I've made some amazing friends through the various groups on there discussing afterlife subjects and, and everything related to it. Yeah, it's wonderful. And how about a little bit about you? You're coming to us. You're. <laughs> we just discovered you are in the afternoon as we are recording this, and I am in the morning. Yes, it's um, mid-afternoon here in um, where I am at the moment in uh, Scotland in the UK. Um, it's a quite a warm day today. It's, uh, it's been great. Um, and I'm looking forward to telling you all about um, the various topics that I've been in, involved in for the last, certainly in the last 10 years, but overall the last 20, 25 years. Um, I actually became interested in spirit communication, um, probably around about 85, 1985, 86, and started to read various uh, books on, on the subject. And I first stepped into a spiritualist venue um, around the age of 18, it was about 1988, and I didn't know what to make of it, but I was fascinated. And these people were there, and they seemed to have always been there. They were part of the furniture. These, these were older people. I was a kid. Um, but I wanted to know how on earth they knew the stuff they knew. I wanted to know, um, I was curious, you see. I wanted to know how these mediums did what they did. What was clairvoyance? What was clairaudience? What did it mean? How did it work? Um, and that was the only reason I stepped through the door of this place. But it became a big part of my life. So great that you started at a young age. And it, it really doesn't matter what age people start, but uh, it, you know, it's, it's exciting to hear that at a young age you had these questions, and so you went looking yeah. for the answers. That's right. That's right. Um, there was, um, well, there's been various turning points, I'd say, over the last 25, 30 years um, for me personally. But um, more recently, I'll just say that in about 99 or 2000, I read um, a friend's copy of the book um, On the Edge of the Etheric by um, Arthur Finlay. Um, and I was so fascinated by this old book, um, and I wanted to learn more. I wanted to read more and find out um, as much as I could. Again, the same curiosity. And so I started to actually buy my own vintage books on the subject, and there were hundreds available. And I buy them online um, or maybe get them from old bookshops, you know, that sort of thing. And <laughs> it became a bit of an obsession, actually, because I ended up with a library of about 800 titles. Wow. Um, on the subject of spirit communication. Um, some of them are now, I mean, years later, of course, some are quite rare, some aren't. Um, but in my opinion, a lot of them contain some real truth about the possibility of communication with the afterlife. 
Yeah. Carl, let me just back up a second. After you stepped your first foot into the spiritualist uh, church and started looking for answers, did you mm. actually sit in circle and become a medium, you know, and dabble in that before collecting well, not, all these books? Not at all. Um, oh, okay, okay. As I say, 18, I walked in this place, and the place, it was a local run church, and it was totally independent of, of any large organization. It was run by a, a married couple, an older couple. Um, and I went along a few few evenings. I used to go straight after work. And after a few weeks of attending, on a, maybe a Saturday night, I can't quite remember, um, on one occasion, the lady that ran the place, the, the, the head medium, let's say, um, she said, we have a psychic development group. I said, oh, what's that? She said, well, we'd like you to, to join if you want to come along. She said, we think because you're interested and because you're so um, curious, you might find that, that it suits you. So I didn't know what psychic development was. I didn't even know there was such a thing. Um, but I went along to this first Thursday group, and I expected to see just as many people there as on the other nights I'd attended, um, you know, 20 or 30 people. But no, this was a small private group of seven people. And I thought, well, no, maybe I've come on the wrong night. You know, it seemed very um, private. Um, but they were keen and they were friendly. And I sat and I joined in and we had a guided meditation. Now, at that time, I knew nothing about meditation. I'd not practiced anything at all. Um, but this guided meditation was really um, an exercise in practicing clairvoyance, and I wasn't aware of that. So the session started, and it was almost, I got my eyes closed, the room was in sort of low light, we were all very relaxed, and they, again, they were all much older than me. Um, but I found, I was so amazed that, that it was like turning on a television. I got images and scenery unfolding in my mind's eye, and I was just relaying all this stuff to these, these people when it was my turn to speak. And at the end, after about half an hour, I said, was that okay? And they said, have you done this before? I said, no. Um, why? They said, well, that's amazing because you, you've talked about all these different things that you're seeing in your mind's eye. And that's natural clairvoyance. I said, no, it's not. <laughs> of course, it is. don't be silly. But they were right. And we all have this natural ability. We just need to be in a position to to um, to try it out. And that was that was my first step, if you like, into understanding how um, clairvoyance, clear audience um, works. And I eventually started to learn more about the actual mediumship, the communication, and it, it changed my life. It was one of the first turning points, let's say. Yeah, fantastic. And it's really nice to hear your story because so many people starting out are interested in this, but, you know, where do I start? And you just jump right in, you know, and... Uh, and but it wasn't, it wasn't frightening. No. It wasn't scary. I was interested. And these were all friendly, nice, friendly people. They weren't strange. They might have been a little eccentric. But I think if you're delving into something different, um, you need to have an open mind, Um and again, because I wanted to know so much, um, I, was fi I was finding answers um, were, were provided for me. And eventually, um, I was able to hold a small group at home in a spare room, and we had psychic development at home. And there were six or eight of us, I can't quite remember, there's a few, and new faces, new friends. And we were, it was very successful. But at that point in 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 my understanding, I knew nothing about any other form of mediumship. It was all, the, the, the only understanding I had at that point was that it was all a mental process. You know, the information would come into the mind of the medium, and then you would relay that information out to the person you're speaking with. Um, and it wasn't until much later that I found there were there are other forms of mediumship, um, and some are quite uh, unique. And some are very special. Um, and but on, I, I will come back to that. I'd like to come back to that. Yes. That's all right. uh, definitely. <laughs> definitely. We're along for the ride on your journey. So oh, where do you want to continue? So you now have 800 titles on your I, bookshelf. I've got, I've got all these books. And I, I'll be honest, there's 
the shelves are heaving and I've probably read about 10 or 15 percent of them it would take me years to get through them all but they're there for reference yes. um, at the moment so but out of one of these books um, I, I picked this book um, I think I bought it on eBay to be honest I don't know if I'm allowed to say eBay but there sure, we are it's twice. Say anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, I bought this book it was falling apart it was very old. It was it was getting on. It was about a hundred years old. Um, Nineteen thirteen. It was published, and it was basically um, an Edwardian journal of spirit communications, um, published in nineteen thirteen, and it described how a lady called Emma Holden acclimatized herself to her new conditions in the afterlife after her death in in nineteen o four. She learns how to communicate with her family on Earth. And then it talks about how she progresses in the afterlife to different levels and she finds um, work to do, occupations, um, you know, um, making friends and becoming guides to others and this kind of thing. And I thought, this story deserves a wider audience. And I I was amazed by it. It was a beautiful book. Um, And I thought, how am I going to get this out to people? I'd never published anything before. I didn't know where to begin, but I decided... um, I went through a steep learning curve and I decided to educate myself on the process. And then I set to work and um, I spent 10 months researching, rewriting. um, And eventually my version of Emma's original book was finally in print. And I titled, I entitled it uh, the Edwardian afterlife diary of Emma Holden. And that again became a turning point. It kind of changed my life um, because having produced that book um, I found that a lady called Gwen Byrne had read this she'd read my book and she got in touch because she wanted my help now Gwen had a manuscript of her own uh, for a book that she wanted to produce um, as a sequel to her first book her first book was entitled Russell and the second one that she had planned was to be titled The Russell Connection Now, over the phone, uh, Gwen and I were talking, and she told me that Russell was her son, who she lost at the age of nine to cancer. He passed away in uh, 1963. But she told me that years later, they were reunited in the seance room. And I was fascinated. I thought, is this possible? So um, she talked to me about mediumship and physical mediumship. And Gwen told me that if the conditions are right, people in the spirit world can return to us in a solid form in this way. Um, I'd only read about such things before, but um, having learned and practiced mental mediumship, you know, the the, the mediumship I talked about earlier, uh, but this woman, Gwen Byrne, had first-hand experience of seance room materializations. I couldn't believe it. Um, So I decided to help Gwen with this second book, and again, it changed everything. Um, I'd like to talk to you a little about Gwen's story, because it's quite amazing, just for a minute or two. Yeah, of course, and and just to describe, we've mentioned physical mediumship on the show a couple of times, but it doesn't mean people have heard it. Maybe just describe what, I'm sure in your story, you know, what the seance room looked like and, you know, maybe how Russell appeared. Just how you just said it, that people can come back in a solid form, just... (laughs) <laughs> gave me goosebumps Uh-oh. it does it does it's 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 very strange and it's such a rare thing um but after um Gwen and her husband Alfie had lost their son um they had um communications from him through through mental mediums those are the kind of mediums that receive the, you know the telepathic or mental spirit messages but 19 years later um a phone call came they had a call from that from a seance group of a physical medium named Rita Gould and their lives were changed because apparently Russell had materialized in this group and he had correctly given out his parents telephone number and then he insisted that somebody from the group call his parents. Wow Carl, wow. Now hearing this from Gwen I was stunned Um, but she went on and told me she says um, after the call came in um, they arranged uh, her and her husband arranged to go to this circle <clears throat> and they nervously attended the group for the first time and they sat hand in hand waiting in silence. Um, <clears throat> while they're waiting there in this seance with a few other people, the first spirit voice they heard was their son Russell. 
And instead of talking and chatting, he began to sing a song to his mother. And <clears throat> that story always gets, gets me. It always gives, puts a lump in my throat because it's, it's so emotional. Um, the possibility of that kind of reuniting um, between loved ones, whether it be a son, daughter, mother, ch child, whatever. <clears throat> um, but obviously, this happened. And Gwen and her husband, Alfie, decided to, to um, visit Rita Gould's seance group um, on a more regular basis. But they were re reunited with the son, Russell, each time. Was, was there, I hate to interrupt, but it, was there something specific about that song? Uh, was, ah, I'm glad you asked me that, actually, because um, apparently Gwen's told me since that it was this, he sang the very song that she sang to him while he was in the hospital bed before he passed away. Now, nobody else in that room knew these people. The medium didn't know anything about them. <clears throat> so you can't, you can't say that this information was in the minds of other people, you know, but the boy's voice was the same as when he was in life. Now, as I say, I've got other kind of um, uh, similar kind of stories to tell you. But of course, listening to their son in this seance room with these complete strangers, um, they noticed, they realized, and they, um, they understood that he was the same silly child, the same loving, clever boy that he always was. Um, but this time he had years of additional experience from life in the spirit world or in the afterlife. Um, and some of these amazing sessions were actually recorded. And uh, Gwen herself has given me some of these tapes for safekeeping. Um, <clears throat> if anybody wants to listen to one of Rita Gould's seance sessions um, where Russell is speaking to those present, um, they can find it on my website, which is psychicbookclub.com. Um, and it's under the <clears throat> the page Russell about the book and all the rest of it. So that's there. It's quite amazing. It's about a 50 minute recording. Um, so anyway, I agreed to help Gwen publish her second book. Um, and after about a year's a year work a year of work, and um, 400 pages later, the Russell connection was ready for for sale. Um, <clears throat> if if I can just say, I also sort of in my own. Um, private investigations, if you like. Oh, I sound like a detective. That's not quite true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's all right. <laughs> I, I own my own investigations, let's put it that way. I, I became aware of other physical mediums that were sort of working the circuit, if you like, and hold, ho holding seances or hosting seances. And I, I wanted to experience this for myself. Um, and there are a few, um, only a very few physical mediums in the world. Um, and I made it my business to to pay my way to get a seat at some of these seances to see what it was like. I was expecting the same kind of solid materializations with the light on and, you know, a seven foot form of Hiawatha would come walking through the wall and all of this. Well, that for me didn't happen, but it certainly happened for some people. Now, I just want to talk to you about um, how I moved on to, to um, work with Leslie Flint's yes. um, material um back in 1984 i'd read a book called life after death which became a bestseller um written by a uk journalist called neville randall and that was about the mediumship of leslie flint um flint was a physical medium in the uk who was able to allow spirit people to speak in their own voices the voices weren't channeled um but they came through a spirit made artificial voice box um, now, I've got a clip, an audio clip I'd like to play, yes. of Les Flint himself talking very briefly, it's only a few seconds, where he talks about how this communication, this type of mediumship works. So if you're, if you're okay, I can play that for sure. you. Okay. Uh, the voices are quite independent. This has been proven scientifically by all manner of tests over many, many years. And the voices speak sometimes at a distance from me, sometimes in my vicinity, but the voices themselves are quite clear-cut and separate from me as an individual. I have nothing to do with it. In fact, I'm quite normal. I talk to the voices, and sometimes I'm heard to speak at the same time. Sometimes you can hear me coughing because I suffer the chest complaint. I regret to say I often cough during a session, and this often cuts through a voice when it's speaking. Now, that was the voice of the medium himself, um, describing how his mediumship works on an old radio show. 
um, from about 1971. Um, I was reading about this kind of communication. I knew very little about it, but reading Neville Randall's book about Flint's work, um, I noticed it contained transcripts from actual recordings of voice seances by Leslie Flint. Um, so these were the actual words of dead people, if I can say such a thing. Sure. And in 1984, I'm reading this, I'm a teenager, but it blew my mind. Um, I couldn't believe it. Could it be real? You know, could it all be fake? Was this guy putting the voices on? Did he have friends in another room and they had equipment and microphones and all the rest of it? Um, but later on, in, it was actually 1998, um, I found the Leslie Flint Trust website. Um, and this website was full of audio recordings of these spirit voices. Now, uh, Mr. Flint passed away himself in 1994. I, I never actually got the chance to see him. I wish I had because I could have. I could have gone. I just didn't have the nerve, to be honest, to go and see him. I didn't think I'd be taken seriously. Um, but having found this website, um, I found that there were all kinds of recordings of all kinds of different people recorded live um, talking about how they arrived in the spirit world or in the afterlife and how they got on with their time there and what they did. Um, so I'm listening to these voices on this whole website, um, voices that I'd only read about, you know, um, and they were giving descriptions of the afterlife. And it was so exciting. I, I, I began recommending this Flint Trust website to everybody, and, and I bought multiple copies of uh, Neville Randall's book, Life After Death, and I, I gave copies away to friends and anyone I thought was interested. Um, I couldn't believe my ears. I really thought it was amazing. Now, I've also got um, for you um, two or three very, very short um, recordings of Leslie Flint's seances. Um, they're only a few seconds each. Now, he sat for, he, he worked, if you like, as a medium for about 60 years. It was the main part of his life. It was his life. Simple, really. Um, and he had hundreds of people would visit him. They would travel for miles. They may have been in London. He was in London, but they came from other parts of the world, from the States, from Europe, from Australia, New Zealand, all over. Um, and they came to see him in the hope that they could speak to their own loved ones. Of course. And let me just ask Carl, uh, Leslie was tested, wasn't he, just to make sure that there was no fraud involved? And That's right. He was very highly tested. That's right. Um, over years, um, in the first what can I say, probably 20 years, he was tested numerous times with the technology that was available at the time. So we're talking about the 1930s, 40s and 50s um, and on into the 70s. Um, he had throat microphones, his mouth was taped up, um, all kinds of things were tried um, and the voices still came. Now, people have said some strange things um, in that, well, if the voice isn't coming through his vocal organs, through his throat, it must be coming through his stomach. Which is just the most ridiculous thing you could imagine. Right. So the skeptics, or those that were completely baffled by this kind of um, mechanism of mediumship, were desperately trying to find an alternative. Um, they were saying he was a ventriloquist. Um, they were saying there were accomplices. But but Mr. Flint would go. He could he could do his mediumship wasn't um, dependent on the location he would be invited to uh, public halls and he would demonstrate in front of hundreds of, of people or he would be invited to a private home and he'd arrive and there'd be three or four people there and still the spirit voices would come. So location didn't matter. Um, now, I could talk to you for two hours about this, but I won't. Um, Leslie Flint had one main regular spirit helper um, that would come through. Um, he called himself Mickey. And Mickey was a, um, <laughs> a communicator with hidden depths. He came across as a, a Cockney Londoner um, or a London Cockney, um, a youngster. Um, and Mickey actually talked about his life and he said that he was killed um, around about the age of 11, um, around about 1910. And he used to sell newspapers outside one of the London tube stations. And he was killed in a traffic accident. But he became Leslie Flint's um, initial speaker. He would always be there before other communicators would come through. 
So Mickey's often heard on, on Flint recordings saying, hello, how's everybody? We've got somebody here for you. I'll come back later. But often Mickey would speak for half an hour to an hour about various subjects. Now, he would address those present. But the most interesting thing for me is that whoever was communicating from the spirit world um, at a Leslie Flint recording or seance um, or sitting, um, Mr. Flint would also interact. He'd be involved. He wasn't in a trance. Um, he wasn't asleep. He would talk with them. Um, he would listen quietly because if the communication was a private thing between the person who'd booked the sitting and the spirit communicator, Mr. Flint would keep, keep out of it. But if the opportunity arose, he would laugh at the jokes and he would get involved in the conversation. So there was no trance involved. Spectacular to imagine that. Mm. I mean, the, the possibility, the, 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 the reality of it is just too much for some people. I, I find it amazing and I still question, I still question even years later. But here's a very short clip of Mickey talking to those in the room from about 1972, this one. Hello, James. Very well, Mickey, thanks very much. You're dolled up tonight, aren't you? What? <laughs> you like candy moons? Yeah, getting to the end of the summer, I can't wear them much more, Mickey. What's the name of you then, Mitch? Well, now, I mean, I'm interested. How do you know about uh, Obviously, you do know about the brother. Look, mate, if you, if you was kept um, working as hard as I am with old, like old Flint, you'd know that you're in touch with most things, mate. I see. Yeah, I mean, I'll get a lot from his brain box, you know. Because <laughs> well, I'm so close, see. I mean, when you're working with a meeting like I am, you don't miss much, mate. You know what's going on in your world. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people from outside come down to work to help when there's distress. And when there's needs, they come down to work. Well, that's good. Well, you know, I'm sure that you know that you're doing the right thing. Yes, I am. Oh, 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 and he used to sing them, and when she wasn't feeling too good, she'd sometimes sit in a chair and sort of sing to herself. Now, that was Mickey, but at that point, towards the end of that recording, um, he would then allow, in this case, the gentleman that was speaking, his mother in the spirit world, to come through and take over the the conversation. So Mickey introduced people. Um but he would interact with those sitting there and have a laugh and a joke with them to, to hopefully break the ice and, and help people relax. Yeah, and, it, and he's playful, and it, it's kind of hard to hear the words, but I know um, we would listen to it a couple of times. But, you know, this we just have to remember this was recorded at the – we didn't have current day software <laughs> doing this. So, And you've done quite a bit of work to restore some it's, of these. It's a, a vintage recording. Yeah. Um, so – we have Mickey as a regular communicator, introducing those that come through later. Now, Mr. Flint had a lot of um, other people's loved ones coming through for communication, but he also had a lot of well-known people coming through, um, which bothers a lot of people who listen to these things because they think, well, if he had all the famous people come through, well, why would they want to speak through Leslie Flint in the way that they did? When I say through him, I don't mean through him in a physical sense. I mean independently of him um now this short very short clip is a voice which is nothing like in my estimation is nothing like mr flint's voice at all um and it's the voice of somebody who passed away in 1948 a gentleman called um mahatma gandhi now gandhi was killed in 1948 but this recording i think is from about 1962 if i remember rightly um, it's quite a bit shorter than the previous one, if you're happy for me to play that. Yes, of course. We have all the time in the world, so. All right. Man's happiness is in the knowledge and the realization of the life that is to come. The earth life is but the training ground. It is but the school in which man must learn the lesson. 
which will in consequence give him the opportunity to inherit the kingdom of the living father. There is so much ignorance in your world. So few are students. So few are prepared to learn. So many are selfish and willful and foolish in the extreme. Now, that voice um, who identifies himself as Gandhi um, is talking about the ignorance of people in the world. I mean, this was recorded before my I was born, um, so we're looking at 50 or something years ago, but he was talking about how things were at that point. I don't know what he thinks now, if he's around, um, but there was an awful lot of philosophical communications came through as well. Um, and also remember that because Mr. Flint was recording his uh, seances or his sittings for oh, 50 years, there are thousands of them. Um, and there's one more very brief one before I talk about what I've been doing recently uh, that I'd like you to hear. And it's a husband and wife, very private. You've got Leslie Flint in his chair in the room, in his home in London. And then the gentleman that, that traveled from Sweden, his home in Sweden, came over to London to see Flint on a regular basis for about 50 or 60 occasions to speak to his wife who had died previously. Um, and this is a lady called Annie Nanji. Um, she was European. Her husband was Indian, although they lived in Sweden. Now, Annie's speaking to her husband. Um, and Mr. Flint is very quiet. He's not. You can't hear him. But here we are. The others will know, like you and I know, that it is not the end. You know, that is not the end. It is the beginning of a greater and a more wonderful existence. Yeah. When I come to you in the flat, I wish I could do certain things to make you know, yeah. so that you see and hear me. But I, I don't sense. Uh, I know you feel me. Yeah. I know you sense me. But I wish you could see with your eyes and you could hear with your ears. Yeah. When I come and I try to make you see me. Like when you come here, I can talk with you, don't like me, and I wish I could do this at home. Yeah. That is what I would like so much. Now that that to me is quite, in a way, can be quite emotional in 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 some ways because if you're listening to it from the communicator's point of view, she's saying, "I want you to see me, I want you to hear me, but I have to come to a medium like this for us to communicate." Because obviously in this case, her husband didn't have the capability um, of mediumship. He wasn't able. Um, so, but there are, I think I've got about 50 or 60 recordings of this married couple talking privately. That's so special. Carl, what that just did for me is it, it just had this vision of, Everybody, I mean, many of us are listening to this program and we want so desperately to know that our loved ones are around and to hear her voice that she too, you know, wants her husband to know that she's there and uh, it's really yes. beautiful because I mean, any one of us could think of our loved one saying the exact same words, really of beautiful. Course. And they do, they want us to know that they're around. It's, it's, um, it's not a one way thing. They also... Um, they're happy to be with us, they're happy to help us, they're happy to support us in whatever we do. And if we're sad, they're sad. And if we're happy, they're happy. That relationship, that connection never ends. Um, and listening to recordings like this of um, what I believe are genuine spirit communicators talking in this way, it makes it more real for me. Um, now... I just wanted to say a little more uh, and talk about what I've been doing and where these recordings have actually come from. Why, why have I got them? Why do I have them? Um, well, where are we? There we are. In, nine, um, in 2015, um, I was contacted online by a gentleman named Jack Andrews, who lives in Arizona. Um, and he got in touch um, to talk to me about Leslie Flint and the Leslie Flint Trust website, which I was aware of. Now, I'd spoken to Jack about various other things, afterlife-related stuff, um, and I knew that he'd been involved in the Leslie Flint Trust uh, website and the recordings, but I had no idea how much work he'd put in over the years. 
um, Jack himself had converted hundreds of um, original Flint sales recordings um, for the original website. Um, but Jack wanted to know if I could help. Now, it turned out that the old website needed an update. In fact, it needed replacing. Um, it had been online for 20 years, and some of the recordings needed updating um, and replacing too. Now, I was such a fan of Flint's mediumship by this point, I couldn't resist. Um, <laughs> I couldn't believe, you know, the, the, the opportunity. Um, again, let's say perhaps this for me was another um, turning point, perhaps. Um, so after discussions um, with members of the Flint Trust, um, I accepted the challenge. Now, just to mention the trust itself, um, Mr. Flint, the medium, passed away in, two, uh, sorry, in 1994, um, and in 1995, his friends, um, Reverend Larry Taylor um, and Gwen Vaughan um, and some other friends decided that all of these recordings, 60 years worth of mediumship by one man, um, needed preserving and promoting. So they formulated or formed this trust um, to keep safe all of this work. Um, so after d talking about the, uh, the needs of the new website with members of the trust um, in about 2015, a couple of years ago, I started from scratch with a brand new website. Um, I gave it the look of the original that had been online for 20 years. It didn't seem right to change it. Um, I made it more streamlined and modernized it, made it more user-friendly. Um, but the audios themselves, those hundreds of recordings were the next hurdle. Um, they'd been online for so long. Um, but obviously now technology has moved on. It became obvious that I needed to go back to original source material and start over. Um, I was Luckily, I was given access to Leslie Flint's original library um, in London. And that's, yes, I, I couldn't believe my luck. And then uh, later, um, I've been, well, in the last couple of years, I'm still being sent cassette tapes, recordings from people who'd attended Leslie Flint seances, and there are so many. Um, I'm currently negotiating, actually, with two other agencies, two groups, um, to secure some hundreds more. So the work goes on. Um, but these tapes, these recordings, they still, some of them still need digitizing. Some need re-digitizing. So I've got my own recording equipment and some audio software to enhance the original tapes. And I now have um, a second library um, of hundreds of Leslie Flint science recordings, um, plus articles and photographs, and they've all got to go online. Um, as I say, there are now thousands of these things, so I might be busy with this work for some time yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> just when you close, you think you're close to finishing, more will come in. I think this is definitely a lifelong passion, and I am so excited because what you just did by playing those audio examples just makes me want more. Yes, yes. I mean, a lot of the recordings are 30 minutes or more. Um, some of them are 50 minutes to even an hour and a half, and we need patience to go through them and to listen. Um, you might find that some people, actually people have got in touch and they say, I'm doing housework and I'm listening to Leslie Flint silences. And somebody will say, I'm driving along and I'm listening to Leslie Flint silences. So you can be doing two things at once while you're listening. It's wonderful. And not just to hear voices of messages between loved ones, but uh, it, words of inspiration. And I'm sure there's you chock full of uh, inspiration about things about life and the afterlife, correct? Yes. yes. I mean, um, those that went to see Mr. Flint to, to, uh, to, to discuss um, important matters with these spirit communicators, they had important questions. They wanted to know how did it work? Um, what happens when you die? Um, what about later? What comes later? What about religion? What about God? What about animals in the spirit world? All these questions have been asked of these spirit communicators. Now, I played you a short clip of Mickey, the Cockney lad, um, that always shows up at Leslie Flint recordings. Now, he had certain answers to these questions, but he only knew so much. But he would then say, right, well, we need to get somebody else in who might know a little more. And they might have um, a 12th century monk may come through who has hundreds of years of experience living in the afterlife and meeting other souls and gaining extra experience. So whereby Mickey, for example, had been in the spirit world, let's say 40 or 50 years, 
So in a way, he's more of an adult, much more of an adult than a youngster. Somebody who's been in the spirit world for 200, 300, even up to a thousand years, some of them or more, they have more experience. And you can tell when you listen to somebody through the Leslie Flint recordings, somebody who's been in the, in the spirit world doing the afterlife for a lot longer, they have a different tone about them. They have, they speak more slowly, they speak more carefully, and they have such a lot of depth to the philosophy that they, they talk about. And, um, so as you say, lots of questions and lots of questions have been asked. Um, and the answers are all there. We just need to spend time to go through them to find the answers that we personally need. Mm, can you answer the question about animals in the afterlife? Can I? Yeah. Me, me personally? From what you've learned from the Leslie Flint. Wow, times. that's a good question. Um, there is one recording, a uh, particular recording, where Mickey himself is asked about this, um, but others have been asked. Um, in fact, there's a compilation tape, and I think Jack Andrews, who I mentioned earlier, has, um, has put this onto YouTube, because Jack, having worked with the recordings originally, um, is now working very hard with a YouTube channel uh, called the New Leslie Flint Trust, um, and that can be found easily online. And there are some recordings there. There's quite a few recordings, actually, uh, which runs in tandem with the current website that I'm working with. And there is this recording um, of Mickey talking about what happens with animals afterwards. And they do survive. This is the information we're getting, that they survive um, and that people are reunited with the, with the cats, dogs, horses that they loved in life. There's one recording of a gentleman... I forget his name just at the moment. Oh, George Wilmot. That's his name. Actually, this recording's on the Flint website. And George is talking about his arrival in the spirit world. And he's shocked and surprised to find the horse that he used to have for his work is there to meet him and greet him. And this horse follows him around. And he can't understand how he, how is the horse there? Because the horse died. Now, this man's also passed away. But he can't understand why the horse is still there. But it's amazing and beautiful to listen to because he then realizes through the fact that this horse is there, the penny drops and he realizes I must also be dead. You know, so there's more, there's more to it. There's more to it. Um, but it's a very beautiful thing. But yes, I've, I've personally learned um, that wherever the love is, whether it be for a human being or a cat or a mouse, or whatever it happens to be, that love continues. And if we want to be reunited with those that we've loved, um, animal and human, they'll be there for us. That's so special. Carl, question for you. Have Has ever been people have come through in a different language through one of these seances? Yes, yes. Um, I was talking to um, a medium recently, um, a lady in London. Now, she attended a, um, a lady called Marion. She attended a Flint, Flint seance a while back, some years ago, actually. And she met Leslie Flint, and she attended this seance, and the recording was made. And she talked about some Polish voices coming through. Now, Leslie Flint, as far as I know, didn't speak Polish. Um, but these voices were recording on recorded onto the cassette. And now, this lady took, the, took her copy of the tape away because copies were given to those that attended. They, they, they didn't go home em empty-handed. Uh, that's why there are probably so many copies around. Um, and she, had, she took this tape to somebody who spoke Polish and the friend said, actually, they're talking about the, the way they died in the concentration camps during the war. Um, so it was genuine Polish. Now... I've come across a few recordings of what are described ancient voices. You could have something described as um, ancient Egyptian or something described as even ancient Roman. Um, now, I know nothing about these kind of languages. I'm not an academic. What are ne what's needed are clear, um, enhanced copies of these very interesting, very curious recordings of foreign voices um, to be analysed. Now, in the past, they've been analysed before, um, and people have said, yes, actually, that's very close to 
Sanskrit or whatever it happens to be. Um, there was another example I was just about to tell you, and the um, it's it's actually slipped my mind, but these recordings of foreign voices, international languages, have been analysed, um, but they're available. They are available. And um, I'm working very hard to try and get the most interesting recordings back out onto the website after they've been enhanced. Hmm. Question uh, that's coming to my mind. Two, two things. Uh, have any of these voices been compared, say it's a famous person, to how they spoke while they were on Earth? And, and if there is a difference in the voice, mm-hmm. would there be an explanation for that? Yes. Um, there have been lots of comparisons made. Um, there's been some comparisons made recently and there's been some done in the past. Um, for example, um, one communicator who was, um, a reasonably or fairly well-known, um, judge in the UK, um, he presided over the, the, some of the largest, um, cases in the UK, crime cases in the UK and his recording came through after his death. And, or sorry, his communication came through after his death. The recording was taken to a friend, a man who knew him in life, and said, who does this sound like to you? And he, he, basically the, 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 um, the, the final word was that, yes, it sounds very much like him. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it was identical, but there are others too. Um, there's one communicator that's been through a few times, um, an American actor um, called Lionel Barrymore, um, who passed away a few, quite a few years ago. And again, I mentioned Jack Andrews. And if people want to look on the new Leslie Flint Trust website, they'll find a comparison that Jack's put together of the, um, the actor Lionel Barrymore, um, who speaks after his death. And on the tape, Jack's put some recording um, of Mr. Barrymore while he's alive. And they're, they're together. And you can hear the similarity. And there is a similarity. Now, I've listened to the, the Gandhi recording, um, and I've listened to, rec- um, that I played earlier, and the Gandhi recordings that were made while he was with us. And to me, they sound very similar. But the most important thing people need to realize is that these voices are reproduced. They're not exact. Because once we've passed away, we don't have vocal cords. We don't have a... Um, you know, the ability to produce a voice like I'm talking to you now into this microphone. I'm using my throat. I'm using my mind to put the words, you know, into action. Um, spirit people have to rely on the artificial voice box, which is something that's created from the essence of the people in the room. That includes the sitters as well as the medium, Flint himself, and um, essence that the spirit people bring into the room during the sitting or the seance and they form this artificial voice box and that's what's used i've heard others talk about this and it it makes sense to me to look at this or to to view this as almost like um like a speaker and you have the the microphone in the spirit world the cable is running through the ether and at our end in this world we have the speaker you know the 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 actual uh, membrane that vibrates on the speaker box itself. You see it do that. So therefore, um, it's um, an artificial form of technology, in a way. So it won't be perfect. There are some communicators that get it horribly wrong, and they sound nothing, nothing at all like they did in life. But also, first-time communicators often find it very difficult because they may have been out of the body in the spirit world, in the afterlife, for quite some time. And to get used to a physical method of communication when in in the afterlife they're they're perhaps communicating telepathically, it's going to be very difficult to step back into that mode of um, thinking in a physical way to vibrate the air to get the sound to travel through this mechanism, this artificial mechanism. Um, So there are going to be discrepancies, but on occasion, the voices sound perfect, in my estimation. Other people say different things. Um, There are those who say that some of the male communicators sound very much like Mr. Flint himself. Now, I can agree with that. Some of them do, but they don't all sound like Flint. Um, 
lots of them have different accents, they have different pitch, they have different intonation. Um, but also, this artificial voice box is connected to Flint. It's actually um, physically connected to him because he's the medium, so everything kind of flows through him. It comes from him. If he wasn't in the room, nothing would happen. You know, he's needed. Um, so there's, I think, I, I don't know. I don't have all the answers. And Flint himself didn't have all the answers. People would ask him these questions over and over throughout his years. Um, but I think because the spirit people are using Flint, they take something from him. Perhaps the artificial voice box was modeled on Flint's own vocal cords. I really don't know. And this is made from ectoplasm emanating it's, from It's, it's ectoplasm, yes, very much so. Are there any pictures of this, or was this all done in the dark? Um, there is a photo. There was some um, infrared experimental photography done um, in the late 60s, I believe. Um, some engineers and uh, researchers got together and they asked Mr. Flint, can we take photos of you during a sitting, during a seance, with our infrared? And they did. And at the moment, um, we have um, a photograph of Mr. Flint sitting in his chair during the sitting. Um, and the engineers viewed this through a monitor of some sort as they were um, with the equipment they had. And they, it's, it's actually been, uh, they confirmed that they saw um, Mr. Flint sitting there. He's looking around, you know, he's acting quite normally. And on his shoulder, you can see a mass of something, almost like um, a bundle of handkerchiefs or a bundle of cotton or something sitting there on his shoulder. Now, we are told that that's an image taken of this ectoplasmic voice box. Now, I've never seen one, so I've got nothing to compare it with. I've only got this very small, very old photo. Um, what I'd like to do is try and find more photos. So when I next go to um, the Leslie Flint Trust archive, I'm going to go through as many photos as I can to try and find more, because at the moment online, there's just the one. Um, but it's very interesting. It doesn't prove to me that it's an ectoplasmic voice box, but it certainly could be. Hmm. And Flint, the, what's the, the leslieflint.com is the website for the... Les, leslieflint.com is uh, the main website where the, the, the audio recordings are, are, are kept for people to listen to. I'm adding to it all the time. There are so many. And there are photographs, there are images, there are um, magazine articles. There's all kinds of information for people to read about him. There are other websites that have um, people have worked, other people have worked very hard to to try and share this information because it's it's for some people it's life changing. Um, so there's a lot of information online. Mm. Are, are you looking for recordings? If somebody's listening and saying, "Oh, my mother sat with Leslie Flint," I think I have a cassette here somewhere. Very interesting you mentioned that. Um, now, there was something. I've got a few notes here because otherwise I'll, I'll probably forget everything I want to tell you. There's, there's so much. I have um, notes too because I don't <laughs> want to forget. So no, we don't want to do <laughs> no. the most important things. Um, yes, besides um, all the recordings um, that I already have, I know there must be hundreds of tapes still out there. Um, some might be kept in old spiritualist churches um, in storage. Um, there might be tapes and recordings kept in the family homes of people who attended Flint seances over the years. And it's important that this material is made available to the interested public and for the future, because I think in the future there'll be researchers who come later after us who want to study these things in, in detail. And I also think um, that technology will have advanced enough that perhaps they can do more with the recordings than we can currently do. So maybe they can learn further. You know, so that's how important it is to get these things out there. So anyone can contact me um, if they have sounds recordings of their own that they need help with. Um, one very, very brief recording. I know we've been talking for a while, um, or I've been talking for a while. Mr. Flint talks about why the spirit people communicate. And that's a valid question. People want to know, well, why are you bothering? What's, what's this all about? Why are we doing this? You know, is it just a bit of fun? Well, no, I don't think it is. But if you don't mind, Sandra, I've got a 30 second clip. I don't mind at all. I really thought we were done and I wanted more. So I'm thrilled that there's another one. No, just a very short one for you. Just I'll be a t there we are. Here we go. Mr. Flint himself talking about um, 
Why spirit people communicate? There are many souls on the other side who are very anxious to make contact with this world, not just only people uh, who wish to contact their relations or their friends to comfort those who mourn, but also of people who, when on earth, were very well known, famous, who feel the need, perhaps, to come back, to comfort the world, and also to give some reality to this life, to make us realize that death is not the end, and that we can do much more in this life to change it, if we have the realization that death isn't the end, and that communication is a reality and a possibility. And I think he's completely right. This, this is said so many times, that death is not the end. Um, but where's the proof? Where's the evidence? We have to find our own evidence. We have to find our own proof. It has to be a personal thing. I think even just using your example, Sandra, if you don't mind, of, of these um, radio shows, these interviews, this for me, I can see, um, or I can you know, visualize that this is your personal search, and we all have to go on our own personal searches. I talked about Gwen Byrne. Um, after her son passed away, she couldn't rest. She wouldn't rest. She knew that her son survived his death after his, age, after, um, after his cancer at the age of nine and nine and three quarters. But she wanted evidence. She wanted to hear from him. And this is what happens. People, once they find an avenue of information, they want more. And it does become quite addictive in a way, which in a way you think to yourself, well, hang on, we need to pace ourselves. We can't keep pestering all these mediums and these people who do channeling and this, that, and the other. We have to live our lives and get on, but we need answers. We all need answers. And I think curiosity is, is my, um, I don't know whether it's a virtue or a fault. I've no idea. <laughs> it's a virtue. <laughs> oh, is it good? I'm glad you agree. I do. Just one last thing I'd like to say, if that's all right. Yeah, and then I have got a question for you. All right. Um, I, actually, I actually think it's vital that we preserve these vintage um, afterlife communications, spirit communications, and related material. Um, audio tapes, cassettes, the old reel-to-reels, and, and even video. You know, Betamax, people still have those, and VHS tapes. Um, all of these things degrade over time. Um, and so many have already been lost over the years. So I'd ask that any of your listeners, Sandra, who have recorded afterlife material or any science recordings to get them digitized um, for the future, because once they've gone, they're gone. We never get them back. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So here's yeah. my question. Yes, yes. And I know we've spoken about this a few minutes, a couple of weeks ago when we spoke, but mm -hmm. So Leslie Flint, no longer on this planet, only right. a handful of physical mediums out there. That's right. I know personally, after uh, sitting in a seance with Scott Milligan, for instance, the reality of these things happening, and it's yeah. incredible. Are there, maybe not outside there, uh, demonstrating physical mediumship, but are there groups of people that are attempting sitting in circle to produce some phenomena because if leslie flint walked this earth i can't help but think with the millions of people on planet earth billions mm -hmm. yeah. that there is the possibility of more physical mediums arising it's um yes absolutely i agree with you um and it's true um i did a survey about a year or two ago um some time ago and i basically discovered that there are hundreds, a few hundred um, groups around the UK and around the world in Australia, um, Europe and America um, of small groups of people sitting together in science conditions, comfortable, you know, relaxed, and they're wanting phenomena. They're wanting spirit communication and they're wanting it in a physical format rather than just mental ideas and thoughts that come and go. They're not interested in clairvoyance. They want actual evidence. They want actual communication, either through some kind of mechanism, um, you know, um, or materialization, which if it's happened in the past, it can happen again. And I think um, that there are probably half a dozen people on the planet who are as capable as Leslie Flint was as capable of producing spirit communicators to, to get their own voices across. Um, and there will probably be, I would say, probably about a, 
a good half a dozen, six people or more around the planet who are capable of producing solid, materialized spirit forms. But they need the opportunity and they need to know how it all works. They may be having a crazy time and think, what on earth's going on in my life? This, none of this makes sense. But they need to understand that the spirit world is there for them. It supports them. And, and they could possibly be, and it is a choice. We all have a choice. We don't have to do any of this. That if they open themselves up to the possibility of helping another person on the planet, whether it be a friend or a total stranger, the spirit world will work through them and amazing things can happen. I had a conversation, I believe you heard it, with uh, Robin Foy from the Skoll Experiment. And he was talking, he's got something called a basic guide, uh, even just to how to start sitting in circles. And it and it takes time, it takes a commitment, it takes uh, mm-hmm. regular meeting. It's not just, oh, let's do it tonight and um, let's see who comes through. I mean, it really takes a commitment of time, uh, sometimes years and years. Oh, yeah. That's right. Um, I, I've actually got um, a, a paperback copy of um, Robin's uh, guide um, that actually that was inspired or, or um, I think it was actually dictated um, through spirit communicators um, during the skull experiment sittings um, or sessions. So it's word for word how they prefer us to sit in, in a modern sense. There are various schools of thought. There are mediums who work with the ectoplasm and there are mediums physical mediums i'm talking about and there are mediums who work through um a different method which is generally known as um energy um mediumship or energy um produced phenomena which is different it's different to ectoplasm it's different to needing the red light and the cabinet which is another tool of the trade if you like um the energy that perhaps i would think uh, robin foy um, discussed with you is a lot softer but it's a lot more um, let's say flexible I would say but I'm going to get into controversial topics here and I don't really want to do that and upset anybody but there are different kinds of uh, physical mediumship and ways of approaching it sure anybody who's listening right now this is episode 183 183 with Carl and if you I don't know how you're listening but if you make your way over to the YouTube page you can just type in uh, we don't die radio in youtube and scroll down to episode 183 in the description i have links to um many of the uh, the books and the websites that carl's spoken of and i'll also put a a link um to this basic guide if you want to have a look it's in my heart carl that um first of all my experience sitting in a physical medium circle uh which i've done twice uh, and even hearing about Leslie Flint has opened up a world to me that I had no idea was possible. And if there's physical phenomena happening, mm-hmm. it is such a great proof to me, evidence to me of our loved ones being around. And I know that, uh, like I said, Leslie Flint is no longer on the planet, but there are plenty of human beings. And if this is something, this conversation is something that you're passionate about, I'm talking about you who's listening right now, I really encourage you to visit leslieflint.com, check out some of these audios, um, get in touch with Carl. um, And and I believe on this planet we can groom people uh, if you're passionate about it to to have some of these things. I want to just tell just a real short thing of, of something I've learned from some new friends of mine. There's a husband and wife in Germany that uh, have been sitting and the there's something called apports these are things that you know what they are carl things that can come out of nowhere <laughs> and yes. all of a sudden be present and you know this husband and wife they've been sitting for a long time but mm. she posted a picture uh, in a f- private facebook group she's got the most beautiful maybe foot tall uh feather black and white feather that yes. showed up in their small room an apport uh out of you know nowhere and just right. absolutely beautiful that like that's possible and for me I, I my intention and my prayer out there is when these these things start happening i mean it's oh it's great proof that there's a whole we're we're not what we seem to be we're so yeah. much more it's proof that there's more that's for sure and and just one little thing you mentioned airports 
our ports aren't always small gifts from the spirit world. They're not always coins or feathers um, um, or gemstones or, or what have you. Um, they can be large items too. Um, they can be pieces of furniture. They could be pot plants. They could be anything that the spirit world will transport into the room or bring to you as a gift. So I think a lot of people uh, reading and learning about apports um, may think that they're small items. They're not always small items. Um, I, I, I always think in whatever you do, um, think big. So if whatever work you're doing, whatever kind of activity you're interested in, whatever your passion is or your hobby, think big. Because if you think big, big happens. Big stuff happens. Same with apports, the same with publishing, the same with whatever you're into. I love that, Carl. Wonderful. You. Do you have any closing words? Love everybody. I love everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I've no idea. What can I say? Um, hey, that's a good start. I, mean, I think love really is a, a currency that makes things happen. Love and service. Yeah. There's awful things happening in the world. We're hearing the news. It's just so depressing. We need to love each other. I'm not in a soft way, not in a stupid way, not in a childish way, but to actually determine in a determined way to actually support each other, whoever we are, whatever we look like, whatever our background is, we all have something in common. Every single person on this planet has something in common. Yes, we eat, we all sleep, we all need this, we all need that, but we're all spirit. And when we leave the body, we all go to the same place. There might be different levels, there might be different areas that we go to, but the same things happen to all of us. We all go through the same thing because we're all human. So to me, there's no division. And that's probably my final word, if that's okay. Yeah, it's perfect. Thank you. And and to our listener, thank you for listening. Uh, just like Carl said, you know, we're all on our own journeys here. I mean, every one of us, and I, I would like nothing more than for you to find what lights you up and and follow it. Some people are excited by mental mediumship. For me, that's all great. But if there's things possible like physical mediumship, trance mediumship, app boards, mm-hmm. things like that, it's like, oh, bring it on. What's the next level? And so it's just fascinating. So Carl, the, first of all, thank sorry, you. What, Go ahead. What, one, one tiny thing. Mental yeah. mediumship can be, mental mediumship can be everything that somebody needs. It yes. can be just enough. You want to get that one message from the one person that's that's left you for the spirit world, they're no longer by your side. You want to hear them say certain words. A mental medium, given the right circumstances, the right opportunity, that can give you those few words that you need for you to get on with your life and know that they're still with you and that they survive. So it doesn't have to be physical mediumship. It doesn't have to be trans mediumship. It doesn't have to be channeling a message telepathically, telepathically given from a spirit person to the medium relayed over to you could be enough for you to get on with your life. So there's all kinds of options. It's, it's wonderful. Uh, but options are beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. It is important to know. Uh, oh, gosh, this has been wonderful, everyone. So as a reminder, uh, our home base is we don't die radio.com and all 183 episodes we have are listed there. Uh, it's certainly listen to this one over again i know i want to to hear some of those audio clips and if you do listen on youtube you can definitely stop and rewind and and look in the descriptions and to have all these links uh also on we don't die radio.com you can click on insiders club and that's basically some gifts i have from me to you there's a it says read a free chapter of my book it's actually the whole book um my gift to you and it's also very healing audio called how to survive grief and a reminder if you're free september 15th through 17th come meet me in scottsdale arizona usa and you'd go to afterlifestudies.org to register and if you are looking for a close-knit group of people that you can talk about this stuff with um i now have a facebook group so on facebook if you want to type in we don't die listeners and you can join that group so we have been talking to the fantastic carl jackson barnes on this interview i invite you to check out his website psychicbookclub.com or also you can contact him and listen 
to so many recordings and find out about the magnificent Mr. Leslie Flint, just go to leslieflint.com. So in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain. I've been your host on We Don't Die Radio. I do believe that life is an education for the soul and your life here on earth is important. And as Carl said, think big and big things happen. Why not, right? So I really want to thank you for listening and we'll see you soon. Thank you.